the 16th of October, I recommenced my excavations in the valley of Beban El Maluk and pointed, but the fortunate spot, which has paid me for all the trouble I took in my researches. I may call this a fortunate day, one of the best perhaps of my life. I do not mean to say, that fortune has made me rich, for I do not consider all rich men fortunate, but she has given me that satisfaction, that extreme pleasure, which wealth cannot purchase, the pleasure of discovering what has been long sought in vain, and of presenting the world with a new and perfect monument of Egyptian antiquity, which can be recorded as superior to any other in point of grandeur, style, and preservation. Appearing as if just finished on the day we entered it, and what I found in it will show its great superiority to all others. Not fifteen yards from the last tomb I described, I caused the earth to be opened at the foot of a steep hill, and under a torrent, which, when it rains, pours a great quantity of water over the very spot I have caused to be dug. No one could imagine, that the ancient Egyptians would make the entrance into such an immense and superb excavation just under a torrent of water, but I had strong reasons to suppose, that there was a tomb in that place, from indications I had observed in my pursuit. The fellows who were accustomed to digging were all of opinion, that there was nothing in that spot, as the situation of this tomb differed from that of any other. I continued the work however, and the next day, the 17th, in the evening, we perceived the part of the rock that was cut, and formed the entrance. On the 18th, early in the morning, the task was resumed, and about noon the workmen reached the entrance, which was 18 feet below the surface of the ground. The appearance indicated, that the tomb was of the first rate, but still, I did not expect to find such a one as it proved to be. The fellows advanced till they saw that it was probably a large tomb, when they protested they could go no further, the tomb was so much choked up with large stones, which they could not get out of the passage. I descended, examined the place, pointed out to them where they might dig, and in an hour there was room enough for me to enter through a passage that the earth had left under the ceiling of the first corridor, which is 36 foot 2 inches long, and 8 foot 8 inches wide, and, when cleared of the ruins, 6 foot 9 inches high. I perceived immediately by the painting on the ceiling, and by the hieroglyphics in basso relievo, which were to be seen where the earth did not reach, that this was the entrance into a large and magnificent tomb. At the end of this corridor I came to a staircase 23 foot long, and of the same breadth as the corridor. The door at the bottom is 12 foot high. From the foot of the staircase, I entered another corridor, 37 foot 3 inches long, and of the same width and height as the other, each side sculptured with hieroglyphics in basso relievo and painted. The ceiling also is finely painted and in pretty good preservation. The more I saw, the more I was eager to see, such being the nature of man. But I was checked in my anxiety at this time, for at the end of this passage I reached a large pit, which intercepted my progress. This pit is 30 foot deep, and 14 foot by 12 foot 3 inches wide. The upper part of the pit is adorned with figures, from the wall of the passage up to the ceiling. The passages from the entrance to this pit incline downward of an angle of 18 degrees. On the opposite side of the pit facing the entrance, I perceived a small aperture 2 foot wide and 2 foot 6 inches high, and at the bottom of the wall a quantity of rubbish. A rope fastened to a piece of wood, that was laid across the passage against the projections which formed a kind of door, appears to have been used by the ancients for descending into the pit, and from the small aperture oil, the opposite side hung another, which reached the bottom, no doubt to ascend. We could perceive, that the water which entered the passages from the torrents of rain ran into this pit, and the wood and rope fastened to it crumbled to dust on touching them. At the bottom of the pit were several pieces of wood, placed against the side of it, to assist the person who was to ascend by the rope into the aperture. I saw the impossibility of proceeding at the moment. Mr. Beachy, whom that day, came from Luxor, entered the tomb but was also disappointed. The next day, the 19th, by means of a long beam we succeeded in sending a man up into the aperture, and having contrived to make a bridge of two beams, we crossed the pit. The little aperture we found to be autolyzing forced through a wall, that had entirely closed the entrance, which was as large as the corridor. The Egyptians had closely shut it up, plastered the wall over, 
and painted it like the rest of the sides of the pit, so that but for the aperture, it would have been impossible to suppose that there was any further proceeding, and anyone would conclude that the tomb ended with the pit. The rope in the inside of the wall did not fall to dust, but remained pretty strong, the water not having reached it at all, and the wood to which it was attached was in good preservation. It was owing to this method of keeping the damp out of the inner parts of the tomb that they are so well preserved, and observed some cavities at the bottom of the well, but found nothing in them, nor any communication from the bottom to any other place, therefore we could not doubt their being made to receive the waters from the rain, with which happens occasionally in this mountain. The valley is so much raised by the rubbish, which the water carries down from the upper path that the entrance into these tombs has become much lower than the torrents, in consequence, the water finds its way into the tombs, some of which are entirely choked up with earth. When we had passed through the little aperture we found ourselves in a beautiful hall, 27 feet 6 inches by 25 feet 10 inches, in which were four pillars 3 feet square. I shall not give any description of the painting, until I have described the whole of the chambers. At the end of this room, which I call the entrance hall, and opposite the aperture, is a large door, from which three steps lead down into a chamber with two pillars. This is 28 feet 2 inches by 25 feet 6 inches. The pillars are 3 feet 10 inches square. I gave it the name of the drawing room, for it is covered with figures, which though only outlined, are so fine and perfect, that you would think they had been drawn only the day before. Returning into the entrance hall, we saw on the left of the aperture a large staircase, which descended into a corridor. It is 13 feet 4 inches long, 7 feet 6 inches wide, and has 18 steps. At the bottom we entered a beautiful corridor, 36 feet 6 inches by 6 feet 11 inches. We perceived that the paintings became more perfect as we advanced farther into the interior. They retained their gloss or a kind of varnish over the colors, which had a beautiful effect. The figures are painted on a white ground. At the end of this corridor we descended 10 steps, which I call the small stairs, into another, 17 feet 2 inches by 10 feet 5 inches. From this, we entered a small chamber, 20 feet 4 inches by 13 feet 8 inches, to which I gave the name of the Room of Beauties, for it is adorned with the most beautiful figures in basso relievo, like all the rest, and painted. When standing in the center of this chamber, the traveler is surrounded by an assembly of Egyptian gods and goddesses. Proceeding farther, we entered a large hall, 27 feet 9 inches by 26 feet 10 inches. In this hall are two rows of square pillars, three on each side of the entrance, forming a line with the corridors. At each side of this hall is a small chamber, that on the right is 10 feet 5 inches by 8 feet 8 inches, that on the left 10 feet 5 inches by 8 feet 9 and a half inches. This hall I termed the Hall of Pillars, the little room on the right, Isis room, as in it a large cow is painted, of which I shall give a description hereafter, that on the left, the room of mysteries from the mysterious figures it exhibits. At the end of this hall we entered a large saloon, with an arched roof or ceiling, which is separated from the hall of pillars only by a step so that the two may be reckoned one. The saloon is 31 feet 10 inches by 27 feet. On the right is a small chamber without anything in it, roughly cut, as if unfinished, and without painting. On the left we entered a chamber with two square pillars, 25 feet 8 inches by 22 feet 10 inches. This I called the sideboard room, as it has a projection of 3 feet in the form of a sideboard all round, which was perhaps intended to contain the articles necessary for the funeral ceremony. The pillars are 3 feet 4 inches square, and the whole beautifully painted as the rest. At the same end of the room, and facing the hall of pillars, we entered by a large door into another chamber with four pillars, one of which is fallen down. This chamber is 43 feet 4 inches by 17 feet 6 inches, the pillars 3 feet 7 inches square. It is covered with white plaster, where the rock did not cut smoothly, but there is no painting on it. The bulls, or apis room, as we found the carcass of a bull in it, embalmed with asphaltum, and also, scattered in various places, and an ale immense quantity, of small wooden. 
figures of mummies six or eight inches long, and covered with asphaltum to preserve them. There were some other figures of fine earth baked, colored blue, and strongly varnished. On each side of the two little rooms were wooden statues standing erect, four feet high, with a circular hollow inside, as if to contain a roll of papyrus, which I have no doubt they did. We found likewise fragments of other statues of wood in composition. But the description of what we found in the center of the saloon, and which I have reserved till this place, merits the most particular attention, not having its equal in the world, and being such as we had no idea could exist. It is a sarcophagus of the finest oriental alabaster, 9 feet 5 inches long, and 3 feet 7 inches wide. Its thickness is only 2 inches, and it is transparent when a light is placed in the inside of it. It is minutely sculptured within and without with several hundred figures, which do not exceed two inches in height, and represent, as I suppose, the whole of the funeral procession and ceremonies relating to the deceased, united with several emblems. I cannot give an adequate idea of this beautiful and invaluable piece of antiquity, and can only say, that nothing has been brought into Europe from Egypt that can be compared with it. The cover was not there, it had been taken out, and broken into several pieces, which we found in digging before the first entrance. The sarcophagus was over a staircase in the center of the saloon, which communicated with a subterraneous passage, leading downwards, 300 feet in length. At the end of this passage, we found a great quantity of bats dung, which choked it up, so that we could go no farther without digging. It was nearly filled up too by the falling in of the upper part. 100 feet from the entrance is a staircase in good preservation, but the rock below changes its substance from a beautiful solid calcareous stone, becoming a kind of black rotten slate, which crumbles into dust only by touching. This subterraneous passage proceeds in a southwest direction through the mountain. I measured the distance from the entrance, and also the rocks above, and found that the passage reaches nearly halfway through the mountain to the upper part of the valley. I have reasons to suppose that this passage was used to come into the tomb by another entrance, but this could not be after the death of the person who was buried there, for at the bottom of the stairs just tinder the sarcophagus, a wall was built, which entirely closed the communication between the tomb and the subterraneous passage. Some large blocks of stone were placed under the sarcophagus horizontally, level with the pavement of the saloon, that no one might perceive any stairs or subterranean passage was there. The doorway of the sideboard room had been walled up and forced open, as we found the stones with which it was shut, and the mortar in the jams. The staircase of the entrance hall had been walled up also at the bottom, and the space filled with rubbish, and the floor covered with large blocks of stone, to deceive anyone who should force the fallen wall near the pit, and make him suppose, that the tomb ended with the entrance hall, and the drawing room. I am inclined to believe, that whoever forced all these passages must have had some spies with them, who were well acquainted with the tomb throughout. The tomb faces the northeast, and the direction of the hole runs straight southwest. The text of the Book of Gates, printed in the following pages, is taken from the alabaster sarcophagus of King Seti I, B.C. 1370, which is preserved in the Museum of Sir John Soane at 13, Lincoln's in Fields. This sarcophagus is, undoubtedly, one of the chief authorities for the text of that remarkable book, but before any attempt is made to describe the arrangement of the scenes and the inscriptions which accompany them, it will be well to recall the principal facts connected with its discovery by Giovanni Battista Belzoni, who has fortunately placed them on record in his narrative of the operations and recent discoveries within the pyramids, temples, tombs, and excavations in Egypt and Nubia. London, 1820, p. 233 ff. In October 1815, Beltsoni began to excavate in the Biban al Moluk, i.e., the Valley of the Tombs of the Kings, on the western bank of the Nile at Thebes, and in the bed of a watercourse he found a spot where the ground bore traces of having been moved. On the 19th of the month, his workmen made a way through the sand and fragments of stone which had been piled up there and entered the first corridor or passage of a magnificent tomb, which he soon discovered to have been made for one of the great kings of Egypt. A second corridor led him to a square chamber which, being thirty feet deep, 
formed a serious obstacle in the way of any unauthorized intruder, and served to catch any rainwater which might make its way down the corridors from the entrance. Beyond this chamber are two halls, and from the first of these Beltsoni passed through other corridors and rooms until he entered the vaulted chamber in which stood the sarcophagus. The sarcophagus chamber is situated at a distance of 320 feet from the entrance to the first corridor, and is 180 feet below the level of the ground. Beltsoni succeeded in bringing the sarcophagus from its chamber into the light of day without injury, and in due course, it arrived in England. The negotiations which he opened with the trustees of the British Museum, to whom its purchase was first proposed, fell through, and he subsequently sold it to Sir John Soane, it is said for the sum of £2,000. An examination of the sarcophagus shows that both it and its cover were hollowed out of monolithic blocks of alabaster, and it is probable, as Mr. Sharp says, that these were quarried in the mountains near Alabastronpolis, i.e., the district which was known to the Egyptians by the name of Hetnub, and is situated near the ruins known in modern times by the name of Tel Alamarna. In the Yetnub quarries large numbers of inscriptions, written chiefly in the high Hieratratic character, have been found, and from the interesting selection from these published by Messrs. Blackden and Fraser, we learn that several kings of the ancient and middle empires carried on works in them, no doubt to obtain alabaster for funeral purposes. The sarcophagus is 9 foot 4 inches long, 3 foot 8 inches wide, in the widest part, and 2 foot 8 inches high at the shoulders, and 2 foot 3 inches at the feet. The cover is 1 foot 3 inches high. The thickness of the alabaster varies from 21 to 4 inches. The skill of the mason who succeeded in hollowing the blocks without breaking, or even cracking them, is marvelous, and the remains of holes nearly one inch in diameter suggest that the drill was as useful to him as the chisel and mallet in hollowing out the blocks. When the sarcophagus and its cover were finally shaped and polished, they were handed over to an artisan who was skilled in cutting hieroglyphics and figures of the gods, in stone, and both the insides and outsides were covered by him with inscriptions and vignettes and mythological scones which illustrated them. Both inscriptions and scenes were then filled in with a kind of paint made from some preparation of copper, and the vivid bluish-green color of this paint must have formed a striking contrast to the brilliant whiteness of the alabaster when fresh from the quarry. At present, large numbers of characters and figures are denuded of their color, and those in which it remains are much discolored by London fog and soot. The first to attempt to describe the contents of the texts and scenes on the sarcophagus of Seti I was the late Samuel Sharp, who, with the late Joseph Bonomi, published the alabaster sarcophagus of Oymenepta I, King of Egypt, London, 1864-42. The former was responsible for the letterpress, and the latter for the plates of scenes and texts. For some reason which it is not easy to understand, Mr. Sharp decided that the hieroglyphic characters which formed the prenomen of the king for whom the sarcophagus was made were to be read Oymenepta, a result which he obtained by assigning the phonetic value of O to the hieroglyphic sign for Osiris. The prenomen is sometimes written to be read either Seti Menenta or Seti Menenta. Mr. Sharp did not realize that both the signs were to be read set, and he gave to the first the phonetic value of A, and to the second the value of O. He next identified Amenephtha or Oymenephtha with the Amenophath of Maino, and the Komaephtha of Eratosthenes, saying, Hence arises the support to our reading his name, i.e., the kings, Oymenephtha. Passing over Mr. Sharp's further remarks, which assert that the sarcophagus was made in the year B.C. 1175, we must consider briefly the arrangement of the texts and scenes upon the insides and outsides of the sarcophagus and its covers. On the upper outside edge of the sarcophagus runs a single line of hieroglyphics which contains speeches supposed to be made to the deceased by the four children of Horus. This line is in two sections, each of which begins at the right-hand side of the head, and ends at the left-hand side of the foot. Below this line of hieroglyphics are five large scenes, each of which is divided into three registers, and these are enclosed between two dotted bands which are intended to represent the borders of the valley of the other world. On the inside of the sarcophagus are also five scenes, 
but there is no line of hieroglyphics running along the upper edge. On the bottom of the sarcophagus is a finely cut figure of the goddess Nut, and round and about her are texts selected from the Theban recension of the Book of the Dead, on the inside of the cover is a figure of the goddess Nut, with arms outstretched. On the outside of the cover, in addition to the texts which record the names and titles of the deceased, are inscribed two large scenes, each of which is divided into three registers, like those inside and outside the sarcophagus. On the bottom of the sarcophagus is a large, full-length figure of the goddess Nut who is depicted in the form of a woman with her arms ready to embrace the body of the king. Her face and the lower parts of the body below the waist are in profile, but she has a front chest, front shoulders, and a front eye. Her feet are represented as if each was a right foot, and each only shows the great toe. One breast is only shown. The hair of the goddess is long and falls over her back and shoulders, it is held in position over her forehead by a bandlet. She wears a deep collar or necklace, and a closely fitting featherwork tunic which extends from her breast to her ankles. The latter is supported by two shoulder straps, each of which is fastened with a buckle on the shoulder. She has anklets on her legs, and bracelets on her wrists, and armlets on her arms. The inscriptions which are cut above the head, and at both sides, and under the feet of the goddess contain addresses to the king by the great gods of the sky, and extracts from the Book of the Dead. On the outside of the cover, beneath the two scenes and texts which occupied the upper part of it, was a horizontal line of hieroglyphics which contained two short speeches, the one by the goddess Nut, and the other by Thoth. The speech of Nut is a duplicate of the opening lines of that found on the bottom of the sarcophagus. The speech of Thoth is much mutilated and can have contained little except the promise to be with the king, and a repetition of the royal name and titles. On the inside of the cover were texts, many portions of which are identical, as we see from the fragments which remain, with the chapters from the Book of the Dead which are found on the bottom of the sarcophagus, and which have been transcribed. At each side of the figure of the winged goddess which was cut on the breast was a figure of the god Thoth, who is seen holding a staff surmounted by the symbol of night. When the cover was complete there were probably four such figures upon it, and the texts which accompanied them were, no doubt, identical with those found in chapter 161 of the Book of the Dead. We see the horizon of the west, or the mountain of the west, divided into two parts, and the boat of the sun is supposed to sail between them, and to enter by this passage into the Tuat. On the right hand is fixed a jackal-headed standard, and on each side of it kneels a bearded god, one god is called Tat, and is a personification of the region which is beyond the day, and the other set, and represents the funeral mountain. On the left hand is a ram-headed standard, and on each side of it also kneels a bearded god, as before, one is called Tat, and the other set. The ram's head has the horizontal, wavy horns, which belong to the particular species of ram that was the symbol of the god Knemu. This animal disappeared from Egypt before the 12th dynasty, but the tradition of him remained. In the middle of the scene sails the boat of the sun. The god is symbolized by a beetle within a disc, which is enveloped in the folds of a serpent having its tail in its mouth. In the bow stands the god of divine intelligence, whose name is Sa, and in the stern, near the two paddles, stands Hika, i.e., the personification of the word of power, or magical utterance. The god who usually accompanies Sa is who. On the right of the boat stand twelve gods, who are called gods of the mountain. On the left of the boat stand twelve gods, who are called gods of Setamantet. The boat of Ra, having passed between the two halves of the horizon of the west, now approaches a gateway, the door of which is closed before him. The door of the second division of the Tuat is different from the doors of the other divisions, for it consists of a single leaf which turns upon a pivot working in holes in the top and bottom of the framework of the door. This door is guarded by a serpent called Seset, which stands upon its tail. In the center of the scene, we see the boat of Ra being towed along by four gods standing, each of whom grasps the tow line with both hands. The god is now in the form of a ram-headed man, who holds the scepter in his right hand, and has the solar disk above his horns. He stands within a shrine which is enveloped in the voluminous folds of the serpent Mehen. 
A serpent also stands on his tail before him. In front of the shrine stands Sa and behind it Heikau. The gods who tow the boat are called Tueu. Sun's boat is met in this section by a company of thirteen gods, who are under the direction of a god who holds a staff in his hand. The names of the first seven gods are, Nepame Ninha, Ba, Haru, Biha, A, Knimu, and Set Chet. The third has the head of a ram, and the fourth that of a hawk. The last six gods are described as gods who are in the entrances. The god who bears the staff has no name. On the right of the boat are twenty-four gods, the first twelve of whom are described as those who are at peace, the worshippers of Ra, and the second twelve as the righteous who are in the Tuat. On the left side of the boat of Ra is the god Tem, who is depicted in the form of an aged man, leaning heavily on a stick which he grasps in his right hand. For male beings who are lying prostrate on their backs. Twenty male beings, with their backs bowed, and their arms tied together at their elbows behind their backs. The inert, and the twenty is the apostates of the Hall of Ra, who have blasphemed Ra upon the earth, who have invoked evils upon him that is in the egg, who have thrust aside the right, and have spoken words against Kuti. The boat of the sun has passed through the second division of the Tuat, and arrives at the gateway which leads to the third division. This gateway is unlike the first, which has already been described, for its opening is protected by an outwork, similar to that which protects the door of a fortified building. The outwork is guarded by nine gods, in the form of mummies, who are described as the second company of the gods, and in this wall, which completely divides the second division from the third, is an opening, which leads to a corridor that runs between two walls, the tops of which are protected by rows of pointed stakes. At the entrance to the corridor stands a god, in mummied form, called Amaw, and at the exit is a similar god called Sekabesnifunan, each is said to extend his arms and hands to Ra. At each side of the angle, near the entrance to the corridor, is a serpent, who ejects flames from his mouth. The flame from the one sweeps along the corridor, at the end of which it is met by the flame from the other serpent which sweeps along the inside of the inner wall. The flames of these serpents are said to be for Ra. The gateway leading to the third division is called Septet Wawawa, and the door thereof, which opens inwards, is guarded by the serpent standing on his tail, who is called Akabai and faces outwards. Along the middle of the third division, we see the boat of the sun being drawn along by four gods, as before. The god Ra stands in a shrine, similar to that already described, and his companions are Sa and Heikau. The rope by which the boat is towed along is fastened to the two ends of a very remarkable object, in the form of a long beam, each end of which terminates in a bull's head. And from the fact that the four gods who tow the boat are seen again at the other end of the beam-like object, with the towing rope in their hands, it is clear that the boat of Ra, and the god himself, were believed to pass through it, from one end to the other. The object is supported on the shoulders of eight gods, in mummied form, who are called bearers of the gods, at each end, immediately behind the bull's head, stands a bull, and at intervals seven gods, who are called the gods who are within, are seated upon it. At the end of this division stand four mummied forms, with their elbows projecting, and their hands crossed on their breasts. On the right-hand side of this division of the Tuat, the boat of the sun passes twelve shrines, each of which has its doors thrown wide open, and so permits us to see a god in mummied form standing inside it. These gods are described as the holy gods who are in the Tuat. Along the front of the twelve shrines stretches an enormous serpent, the duty of which is to protect those who stand in them. Beyond the shrines is a long basin or lake of boiling water, with rounded ends, in which stand up to their waists twelve mummied gods, with blackheads, who either have white bodies or are arrayed in white apparel, in front of each god grows a large ear of wheat. These gods are described as the gods in the boiling lake. On the left of the path along which the boat of Ra passes in this division of the Tuat are two groups of beings. In the first of these we see the god Tem, in the form of an aged man, with bent shoulders, leaning upon a staff, coiled up before him in voluminous folds, with its head flat upon the ground, is the monster serpent Apep. Behind Apep stand nine men, with their arms hanging by their sides, these are called the Chacha who repulse a peepee. 
In the second group is Tam, in a similar attitude, and before he stands nine gods, each holding the symbol of life in the right hand, and the scepter in the left. The nine gods are called Nebukurt, i.e., Lords of Destinies. The boat of the sun has passed through the third division of the Tuat, arrives at the gateway which leads to the fourth division. This gateway is like that which admitted the god into the third division, and its outwork is guarded by nine gods, in the form of mummies, who are described as the third company of the gods of the great god who are within. At the entrance to the corridor which runs between the two walls is a god in a mummied form called Enwerkata, and at the exit is a similar god called Sidata, each god has a ureus over his brow, and each is said to extend his arms and hands to Ra. The corridor is swept by flames of fire which proceed from the mouths of two serpents, stationed each at an angle, and their fire is for Ra. The gateway of the fourth division is called Neteschifa. The monster serpent which stands on his tail and guards the gateway is called Chetbai. In the middle of this division, we see the boat of Ra being towed on its way by four gods of the Tuat. The god is in the same form as before and stands in a shrine enveloped by Mehen. Sa stands in the bows, and Hika at the stern. The boat advances to a long, low building with a heavy cornice, which contains nine small shrines or chapels. In each of these is a god in mummied form lying on his back. The nine gods are described as the gods who follow Osiris, who are in their abodes, literally, holes. Immediately in front of the nine shrines are two groups, each containing six women, who stand upon a slope, one half of which appears to be land and the other half water, these women are called the Hour Goddesses which are in the Tuat. Each group is separated from the other by a monster serpent of many folds called Hiret, and of him, it is said that he spawns twelve serpents to be devoured by the Hours. On the right hand of the path of the Boat of the Sun in the fourth division, we see, twelve gods, bearded and standing upright, who are called the gods who carry along with their doubles. Twelve jackal-headed gods, who stand around the Lake of Life, who is called the jackals in the Lake of Life. Ten Urii, which stand around the Lake of the Urii, and are called the Living Urii. On the left of the path of the Boat of the Sun through the Fourth Division, we see the god Osiris, in mummied form, and wearing on his head the crown of the South, standing on a serpent, and partially covered by the earth of a mountain, his head only is above the ground, and he stands in a naos with a vaulted dome. His name or title, Cantamenti, is written by his side. Before the shrine is a flame goddess in the form of a Ureus, and behind her are twelve gods, who stand in front of Heruor, or, Horus the Aged, the Hererus of the later Greek writers. Heruor is in the form of a hawk-headed man, who leans on a staff. Behind the shrine which contains Osiris stands twelve gods, who are described as the gods who are behind the shrine, behind, or by the side of these, are four pits or hollows in the ground, by the side of each of which stands a god, with his body bent forward in adoration before a bearded god, who holds the symbol of life in the right hand and a scepter in the left. The four gods are called masters of their pits, and their lord is called the master of earths. The boat of the sun has passed through the fourth division of the Tuat, and arrives at the gateway which leads to the fifth division. This gateway is similar to that which guards the fourth division, and is guarded by nine gods, who are described as the fourth company. At the entrance to the corridor and its exit stands a jackal-headed god, the former being called A, and the latter Tekmi, each is said to extend his arms and hands to Ra. The corridor is swept by flames of fire, as before. The gateway is called Eret. The monster serpent which stands on his tail and guards the gateway is called Tika Ra. In the middle of this division, we see the boat of Ra being towed on its way by four gods of the Tuat. The god is in the same form as before and stands in a shrine enveloped by Mehen. Sa stands in the bows, and Hika at the stern. In front of those who tow the boat are nine shrouded gods, with projecting elbows. Each of these holds in his hands a part of the body of a long, slender serpent, and the group is called those who hold a nuchi. In front of these are twelve bearded beings, who are advancing towards a god, who is styled, the god, of his angle. The twelve gods are described as by a ref amatuat, i.e., the souls of the men who are in the tuat. 
On the right hand of the path of Ra in the fifth division of the Tuatar, one. Twelve male beings bowing in adoration, they are described as those who make adorations in the Tuat. Two. Twelve male beings who bear in their hands a cord for measuring plots of ground and estates, these are called holders of the cord in the Tuat. For gods, standing upright, each holding the symbol of life in his right hand, and a scepter in the left. To the four bearded gods on the left of the path of the boat of Ra are, one. A hawk-headed god, leaning upon a staff, he is called Horus. Two. Four groups, each group containing four men. The first is Ref, the second is Amu, the third is Nihisu, and the fourth is Themhu. The Reth are Egyptians, the Amu are dwellers in the deserts to the east and northeast of Egypt, the Nihisu are the black races and Negroes, and the Themhu is the fair-skinned Libyans. 3. Twelve bearded beings, each of whom grasps with both hands the body of a long serpent, these are called the holders of the period in Ament. 4. Eight bearded gods, who are called the sovereign chiefs of the Tuat. The boat of Ra having passed through the fifth division of the Tuat arrives at the gateway which leads to the sixth division. The gateway is guarded by twelve bearded mummy forms, who are described as the gods and goddesses who are in this pylon, and it is called Nedaha. The gate which admits to the sixth division resembles those already described. At the entrance to the corridor, and its exit stands a bearded mummied form, the former being called Mob, and the latter Shada about. These names mean right, or, true, of heart and hidden of heart respectively, and each is said to extend his hands and arms to Ra. The corridor is swept by flames. Between the gate which leads into the sixth division and the division itself, we find inserted a remarkable scene, which may be thus described, in the upper part, from one side to another, a line is drawn, which is intended to represent the roof of the shrine or canopy in which the god is seated, and on it rests a row of kakaru, i.e., spearhead ornaments. From the inside of the roof hang, upside down, for heads of some kind of horned animal. These are called hahayu and are supposed to be heads of gazelle or oxen. In the space between the spearhead ornaments and the side of the Tuat is written words is tolerably clear, i.e., Osiris, governor of the Tuat, but the signification of the last signs is doubtful. M. Lefebure translates the inscription, Osiris, master of Hades, earth, and Tannin. Osiris, who wears the double crown of the south and north, and holds in his right hand the symbol of life, and in his left a scepter, is seated on a chair of state, which is set on the top of a platform with nine steps. On each stop stands a god, and the nine gods are described as the company which is with Sar, i.e. Osiris. On the topmost step is a balance, in which the actions of the deceased are weighed. The beam of the balance is supported either by the deceased or by a stand which is made in the form of a bearded mummy. One pan of the balance contains some rectangular objects, and the other a figure of the bird which is symbolic of evil and wickedness. Behind the balance is a boat, which is sailing away from the presence of Osiris, and it is a pig being driven along by a dog-headed ape that flourishes a stick. In the top left-hand corner is a figure of Anubis, jackal-headed, and under the floor of the platform on which Osiris is seated are figures of the enemy of Sar, or Osiris. From the variant of this scene which is found on the sarcophagus of Cherat Paris, as well as from the sarcophagus of Seti I, we may see that the pig in the boat is called Amma, i.e., Eater of the Arm, and the boat is piloted by a second ape which stands in the bows. On the Paris monument, we see a man wielding a hatchet in a threatening manner and standing near the scales, probably with the view of destroying the deceased if the judgment of Osiris proves adverse to him. The upper part of the space between the roof and the platform on which Osiris sits is occupied by two short inscriptions, which are full of difficulty. The meaning of these texts has puzzled several workers, and even the order in which the characters are to be read has given rise to differences of opinion. One of the chief difficulties in the matter is caused by how the two legends are written on the sarcophagus of Seti I. Looking at the hieroglyphics as they stand, they seem to form one continuous inscription, but if we examine the scene as it appears in the tomb of Ramesses II, we see that we must divide them as above. For purposes of comparison, 
The versions of the texts from the tomb of Ramesses VI, as given by Champollion, Monuments, PL 252, are given. It will be noted that a part of the line immediately over the head of Osiris, given in different places in the latter scene, is immediately in front of the double crown of Osiris, and is immediately in front of the scepter of the god. The pylon which gives access to the sixth division of the Tuat has already been described. The monster serpent which stands on his tail and guards the gateway is called Set M Mod F. The scenes and texts which illustrate the sixth division of the Tuat cannot be obtained in a complete state from the sarcophagus of Seti I, and recourse must, therefore, be had to other documents. In the following pages, however, the fragments of the texts and scenes from the sarcophagus are first given, and these are followed by the complete texts as they are found in the tomb of Ramesses VI, as published by Monsieur E. Lefebure in the third volume of the Memoirs of the French Archaeological Mission at Cairo. The fragmentary texts and scenes from the sarcophagus of Seti I may be thus described. In the middle register are 1. Two of the four gods of the Tuat whose duty it is to tow along the boat of the sun through this division. 2. The god Tem in the form of an aged man, with bent shoulders, and leaning on a staff. 3. The jackal-headed standard called Ra, to which are tied two enemies, who probably represent the damned. 4. The two Uchats, which appear to be keeping watch on the enemies. 5. The jackal-headed standard called Tem, with two enemies tied to it. 6. A mummied form, with projecting elbows, called a fat. 7. The jackal-headed standard called Keeper, with two enemies tied to it. 8. A mummied form, with projecting elbows, called Ormet. 9. The jackal-headed standard called Shu, with two enemies tied to it. 10. A mummied form, with projecting elbows, called Sent. 11. The jackal-headed standard called Seb, with two enemies tied to it. 12. A mummied form, with projecting elbows, called Akasa. 13. The jackal-headed standard called Sar. 14. A mummy form, with projecting elbows, called Akur. 15. A jackal-headed standard called Haru. 16. A god holding a scepter called Shef Ra. The upper register is much mutilated on the cover of the sarcophagus of Seti I, on it we see. 1. Five upright male figures, each of whom holds a large loaf of bread, with both hands on his head. When the scene was complete these figures were twelve in number, as we learn from the variants published by Champollion, and they are called Hitepti Keparo. 2. Six upright male figures, each of whom holds the feather of Mott with both hands on his head. When the scene was complete these figures were twelve in number, and they are called Atamamu Karamat. A few years ago I purchased from a native at Luxor a fragment of the cover of the sarcophagus of Seti I. This is now in the British Museum, number 29948, and it gives the following. 1. Three male figures, each of which bears a loaf on his head. 2. The following fragmentary text, their bread cakes are ordered for them by their gods, their cow is in their hands, and they enter into their abodes at the pylon which destroy its gods. The god Sar says unto them, your bread shall be to you from that which comes forth from your mouths, Hitepti Keparo. In the lower register are 1. Five male figures, who are tending very large ears of corn. When the scene was complete these figures were twelve in number, and they were called, those who work about the plants of grain in the fields of the Tuat. 2. A man holding a sickle, he is one of the seven reapers, of which this section of the scene originally consisted. In the upper register are twelve gods, each of whom stands upright, and has the feather of Mott on his head, and twelve gods, each of whom stands upright, and has a large loaf on his head. These gods are described as Mahdi gods bearing Mott, and the Hitepsha gods bearing provisions. In the lower register are the figures of twelve men, each of whom tends a monster ear of corn, or a tree, under the superintendence of a god who leans on a staff, and a group of reapers, each holding a sickle. Three headless figures kneeling, with their arms tied behind their backs, 
these represent the enemies of Osiris. Behind these stands a fierce cat-headed, or, lynx-headed, god, who holds a huge pointed stake in one hand, and flourishes a large knife in the other. Three foes of Osiris lying on their backs. Around the right arm of each a rope is tied, and the other ends of the three ropes are in the hands of a god called Anku. Three bearded, human-faced hawks, wearing on their heads the double crown of the south and north, the first is called Satathanan, the name of the second is Wanting, and the third is called Mam or Mot. A huge serpent, which bears on its back a god in a sitting posture, the god is called Afutem, and the remains of the text which refers to him say that he shoots forth his flame at those who rebel against Osiris, and that he eats the souls of the enemies of the god. In the lower register are the god Huru Herkandef, seated on a throne, as his name implies. He is hawk-headed, and wears the solar disk encircled by a serpent, in his right hand is the symbol of life, and in his left a scepter. The other forms of his name are unknown. Stars are personified by gods, twelve in number, who stand each with a star on his head. Their names are Awarkert, Kekert, Nebkerta, Tuwadi, Hyat, Haiku, Emidae, Tisare, Emae, Semnesef, Tezememotef, Sikertepu, Twelve goddesses of the hours, face to the right, having each a star on her head. Their names are Ekanutheth, Neten, Netnet, Tuatheth, Amantetermen, One name erased, Anath, Anath, Tate, Eritku, Eritaru, Uatestes, in front of the hours is an enormous crocodile called Abshaam to it, which is described as Osiris, the Eye of Ra. The crocodile stands upon a long funeral mound, out of the end of which, immediately under the head of the animal, appears a bearded human head, i.e., the head of Osiris. The scene that illustrates the eighth division of the Tuat, which is passed through by the sun god during the eighth hour of the night, is introduced by four lines of text. In the middle register are 1. The boat of the sun, in which the god stands under a canopy formed by the body of the serpent Mehen, being towed along by nine gods. 2. Nine large objects somewhat in the form of the hieroglyphic shams, which has the meaning of follower or servant. Unlike this sign, however, each of the nine objects is provided with a huge knife, and from the curved end of each is suspended a human head. M. Maspero is undoubtedly correct in describing these as the servants of the god. The names of the nine servants are 1. Hetepta 2. Amen 3. Sashidabayu 4. Sikin Kaibat 5. Neberchur 6. Menu 7. Mathanu 8. Metrui 9. Parimu 3. A ram, having the solar disk between his horns, and the symbol of linen bandages in front of him, he is an image of Tathanan, of whom he is the first form. 4. A ram, having the crown of the south between his horns, and the symbol of linen bandages in front of him, he is an image of Tathanan, of whom he is the second form. 5. A ram, having the crown of the north between his horns, and the symbol of linen bandages in front of him, he is an image of Tathanan, of whom he is the third form. 6. A ram, having the solar disk and a pair of plumes above his horns, and the symbol of linen bandages in front of him, he is an image of Tathanan, of whom he is the fourth form. In the upper register are five circles of the tuat and a door, which may be thus described. 1. This circle, which is called Sashida, is entered through a door with the name of Tez Neb Tirer, and in it are seated. 1. The image of Tem, wearing the white crown. 2. The image of Kepera. 3. The image of Shu. Each of these is seated upon an instrument for weaving. 2. This circle, which is called Tuat, is entered through a door with the name of Tez Aha Tathanan, and in it are seated. 1. The image of Tefnet. 2. The image of Seb. 3. The image of Nut. Each of these is seated upon an instrument for weaving. 3. 
This circle, which is called as Netaru, is entered through a door with the name of Tezakem Bayu, and in it are seated. 1. The image of Osiris. 2. The image of Isis. 3. The image of Horus, hawk-headed. Each of these is seated as before. 4. This circle, which is called Akibi, is entered through a door with the name of Tez Sheda the Hen Netaru, and in it are seated. 1. The image of Ka Amentet, bull-headed. 2. The image of Ba Netaru, ram-headed. 3. The image of Rim Netaru, ram-headed. Each of these is seated as before. 5. This circle, which is called Netsin Yanifu, is entered through a door having the name of Ten Smakikiu, and in it are seated. 1. The image of Katri, Iknuman headed. 2. The image of Afi, animal headed. 3. The image of Arienphi, Sinocephalus headed. Each of these gods is seated as before. 6. An open door, called Tez Kaibatatuashu, beyond which is a goddess. In the lower register are also five circles, and an open door, which may be thus described. 1. This circle, which is called Hedipat Nebes, is entered through a door having the name of Tet Sem Ermanta, in it are. 1. A goddess standing upright, called Amum. 2. The serpent Mehenta. 3. Three arrows lying on the top of these are the arrows of Ra. 4. A rain-headed god, seated on, instruments for weaving. His name is Nebrikit. 2. This circle, which is called Hikmet Kimio, is entered through a door having the name Tez Ra Keftiu F in it R. 1. Nut, bearded and man-headed. 2. Ta, bearded and man-headed. 3. Sebek Ra, crocodile-headed. 3. This circle, which is called Hap Simues, is entered through a door having the name of Tez Sikamaru, in it are four mummied gods, each with an instrument for weaving in front of him, and their names are 1. Habset 2. Senkit 3. Tebet 4. Temtet 4. This circle, which is called Sihurt Bios, is entered through a door having the name of Tez Septensut, in it are four mummied gods, each with an instrument for weaving in front of him, and their names are 1. Keku 2. Menhi 3. Cherku 4. Kebsta 5. This circle, which is called Atsetika, is entered through a door having the name of Tezku, in it are four Urii, each of which rests upon its instrument for weaving, and their names are 1. Arid Ank 2. Rerid Ank 3. Nezard Ankhet 4. Septat Ank 6. A door called Teza Mehmet M. Sheda F. Beyond it is a figure of the god Nu, who appears to be over the Chamber of Destruction. Having passed through the 8th Division of the Tuat, the Boat of the Sun arrives at the 9th Division, which is passed through by the Sun during the 9th hour of the night. A line of text runs above the upper register. In the middle register are 1. The boat of the sun, with the god Athu standing under a canopy formed by the serpent Mehen. 2. The 12 sailors of Ra, each of whom stands upright, and holds a paddle in his hands, their names are 1. Kenu i.e., the sailor par excellence. 2. Akemsek F. 3. Akem Erd F. 4. Akem Hemi F. 5. Akem Hap F. 6. Akem Nims F. 7. Kenan Nut F. 8. Hapti Ta F. 9. Hitep Wa. 10. Netter Netteru. 11. Cha Tuat. 12. Tepi. 3. A bearded, man-headed hawk, wearing plumes and horns on his head, seated on a basket, or bowl. His name is Muti Kenti Tuat. 4. The Ram God Nesti Kenti Tuat, couchant on a basket, or bowl. 5. The Cow Goddess Net Akenti Tuat. 6. A bearded god, in mummied form, called Hetpit Netter, or Hetipit Netteru. In the upper register are. 1. 
Twelve gods, each of whom is seated upon the symbol of linen swathing. Their names are 1. Nehata 2. Peba 3. Madi or Ariti 4. Menkit 5. Hebs 6. Neti 7. Asti Netter 8. Asti Pot 9. Heatmet Ku 10. Neb Pat 11. Temtu 12. Men 2. 12 goddesses, whose names are 1. Parrot 2. Shimat Ku 3. Net Shat 4. Net Chef Chef 5. Adaatet 6. Net Seta 7. Hent Nut S 8. Net Mat 9. Desert Ant 10. Atku 11. Second Medu 12. Neatered Enkentet Ra In the lower register are 1. 12 Urii, which are mounted each on its instrument for weaving, and each pours forth fire from its mouth. Their names are Name Unknown 2. Pekate Name Unknown 4. Cut to it 5. Tertneshin 6. Apchet 7. Enkhet 8. Shinten M. Name Unknown 10. Ataru 11. Net Wao 12. Net Rika Above the Uriai is a mutilated line of text. 2. Nine bearded gods, who stand upright. Each holds the symbol of life in his right hand, and a staff, the upper portion of which is in the form of a wriggling snake, in the left hand. These gods are under the direction of a god in mummied form, whose name, or description, is Haru Hershituati, i.e., Horus who was over the lakes in the Tuat. The names of the nine gods are 1. Sekti 2. Emsiket F 3. Nehabadi 4. Tkamudi 5. Nebadi 6. Hak Netaro F 7. Panari 8. Tisarari 9. Aha Seket Having passed through the ninth division of the Tuat, the boat of the sun arrives at the tenth division, which is passed through by the sun during the tenth hour of the night. In the middle register are 1. The boat of the sun, in which the god stands under a canopy formed by the serpent Mehen. He holds the symbol of life in his right hand, and a serpent, which serves as a scepter, in his left. 2. A large two-headed serpent called Thes Rao, which is depicted in the form of a pair of horns deeply curved towards the ends where they meet. The head which faces to the right has on it a white crown, and is directly opposite to the face of a goddess, who also wears a white crown, and is called Hurt Ermit, and the head which faces the left has on it a red crown, and is directly opposite to the face of a goddess, who also wears a red crown, and is called Shimerdi, i.e., She of the Two Bows. A serpent is provided with two pairs of legs, one pair is turned to the right, and the other to the left. Within the curve is a large hawk, which bears the name of Haru Kenti. 3. A boat, wherein lies at full length the serpent Angta. 4. For male figures, each of which has a disc in place of a head, each grasps in his right hand an arrow, with a spear-shaped head, which rests on his shoulder, and is pointed downwards. Their names are 1. Tephthra 2. Shisera 3. Taimau 4. Yutu 5. For bearded, human-headed figures, each of which has in his right hand a short spear, which rests on his shoulder, and is pointed upwards, their names are 1. Satu 2. Ertau 3. Kizfu 4. Sikenyu 6. For bearded, human-headed figures, each grasping with both hands a bow, which he holds above his knees, their names are 1. Peti 2. Shamurthi 3. Fisu 4. Ta Over the upper register runs a line of text, and in the upper register are 1. 
the god Ponki, who holds an ankh in his right hand, and a scepter in his left. 2. A beetle, called Keeper Ankh, apparently pushing along a zone of sand, or perhaps entering the horizon. 2. Serpents, standing on their tails, which cross each other near their tips. Their heads and necks are bent at right angles to their bodies, and in the space between them rests a disc. The serpents are called Meninui. To the right is a youthful goddess wearing a white crown, and to the left is a similar goddess wearing a red crown, each holding the index finger of one hand to her mouth, after the manner of children, and each is depicted in the act of sitting, but lacks a seat or throne. An axe, symbol of God, standing on the handle end, with a disc resting on the side edge of the head. On the left is a goddess who is steadying the axe with her left hand, and on the right is a goddess who is steadying the disc with her right hand. The names of the goddesses are Netheth and Kanat, respectively. Each goddess is depicted in the act of sitting, but lacks a seat or throne. 5. Eight goddesses, who stand upright, and hold an ankh in their right hands, and a scepter in their left, they face the eight god, whose tail is stiffened out under him in such a manner as to form a seat for him, and who holds the uchet, or eye of the sun, on his two hands. The first four of the goddesses have each the head of a lioness and are called 1. Seket 2. Menkert 3. Huntheth 4. Usrit The remaining four have the heads of women, and have the names of 1. Amt Neteroes 2. Arid Tathoth 3. Ahat 4. Amath Ermin the name of the ape god is Alf Erman Mod F. 6. Eight gods, each of the first seven of whom holds an ankh in his right hand, and, scepter, in his left, their names are. 1. Armenui, who has the double object in the place of a head. 2. Nebuchadnezzar, jackal-headed. 3. Amenku, hawk-headed. 4. Urshada Taui, man-headed. 5. Semheru, man-headed. 6. Amenheru, man-headed. 7. Kentastef, man-headed. 8. Kentmentef, a god in mummied form, like Osiris, who wears a white crown and grasps a scepter, with both hands, which project from his bandages. In the lower register are. 1. The god Horus, hawk-headed and wearing a disc, leaning on a staff. 2. Five lakes of water, in each of which is submerged a male form. These figures are called the submerged. 3. Three lakes of water, in each of which is a male form swimming, turned over on his breast. These are called the swimmers. 4. Four lakes of water, in each of which is a male form floating on his back. These are called the floaters. The text for the above is full of lacunae and whole passages, consisting of several lines, are wanting. The version from Lanzone's edition, Le Domicile de Esprit's PL. 2. Will be found useful in obtaining an idea of the contents of the legends which accompanied the lakes of water. 5. Lake of water. 6. For female figures, each bearing a serpent on her head and shoulders, the head of each reptile is raised above the head of its bearer, and its tail hangs down her back, their names are. 1. Hedemit. 2. Bekikit. 3. Chetmit. 4. Sunthes. 7. A scepter surmounted by the head of Set. Its name is Set Nehes, i.e., Set who wakens. The eleventh division of the Tuat, which is passed through by the sun god during the eleventh hour of the night, is introduced by three lines of text, and in the middle register are. 1. The boat of the sun, in which stands the god under a canopy formed by the body of the serpent Mehen, on his head are horns and a disc. On the high prow of the boat is a disc, encircled by a ureus, which is called Pestu. 2. Twelve gods, who march before the boat of the god bearing the serpent Mehen on their heads, their names are. 1. Many. 2. Semsem. 3. Sekenu. 4. Shetu. 5. Amma. 6. Amo. 7. Erda. 8. Shapu. 9. Netaru. 10. Athpi. 
11. Ermanu. 12. Fa. 3. The serpent Semshet. On his back rests the red crown, and in an angle of it is a human head. 4. The serpent Sem Nebthet. On his back rests the white crown, from each side of which projects a bearded human head. 5. Neath of the phallus, wearing the red crown. 6. Neath of the red crown, wearing the red crown. 7. Neath of the white crown, wearing the white crown. 8. Neath the young, wearing the white crown. Above the upper register is a line of text, and in the upper register are 1. The god Aper Ra Neb Cheta, above whose body, at the neck, is a disc from which proceed two human heads, the one wearing the white crown, and the other the red crown, in his right hand he holds the scepter, and in the left the emblem of life. 2. A huge serpent, with two pairs of human feet and legs, and a pair of large wings. By its side stands a god with a disc upon his head, and on each side of his head is an uchet. His hands are stretched out at right angles to his body, and each hand touches the end of one of the serpent's wings. An untranslated word may form the name of the winged serpent. 3. A serpent, with a mummied god seated on his back. Above the god is written Chedes, i.e., its body, and by the tail of the serpent is Shedu. 4. The god Tepui, i.e., the two-headed, one head faces to the right and the other to the left. 5. The god Knem Renit, ram-headed, holding a scepter in his right hand and Ankh in his left. 6. The god Nurda, with both hands raised in adoration. 7. The god Ahoyefm Khanef, who has two snakes' heads in the place of a human head, his hands and arms are concealed. 8. The god Aptawi, his hands and arms are concealed. 9. The god Merex Ahoyef, in form similar to the preceding. 10. The god Oen Ahoyef, in similar form. 11. The god Reset Afu, in similar form. 12. The god Tuaharu, in similar form. 13. The god Ma. 14. The god Masekti. 15. The god Hepa. 16. A goddess, seated on the backs of two serpents, which lie side by side, and appear to issue from her feet. Her left hand grasps the body of one serpent, and her right is held up before her face. Her name is Net Ankyo. In front of her are three other goddesses, who are similarly seated. Their names are Net Ku, Nerd Abwi, and Merant Netero. In the lower register are 1. Horus, hawk-headed and wearing a disc, leaning with his right shoulder upon a long staff, and holding in his left hand a boomerang, one end of which is in the form of a serpent's head. 2. A huge serpent, called the Everlasting Set, standing upon his tail. 3. A large pit, with a vaulted roof, filled with fire, wherein the enemies, of Ra are being consumed. The name of the pit is Hatet Kedits, and is presided over by a goddess with the head of a lioness, who holds in her hands a large knife, and pours fire into it from her mouth. 4. A smaller pit, with a vaulted roof, filled with fire, wherein the enemies are being consumed. The name of the pit is Hatet Hantues, and it is presided over by a goddess with a human head, who holds in her hands a large knife, and pours fire into it from her mouth. 5. A pit similar to the above, wherein the souls are being consumed. The name of the pit is Hat Nikanit, and it is presided over by a goddess as in number 4. 6. A similar pit, wherein the shades, or shadows, are being consumed. The name of the pit is Hat Nematset, and it is presided over by a goddess as in number 4. 7. A similar pit, wherein the heads, are being consumed. The name of the pit is Hat Sefuess, and it is presided over by a goddess as in number 4. 8. A very large pit, with a vaulted roof, filled with fire, in which are immersed, head downwards, for male figures. The name of this pit is Ansakitu, the valley of those who are turned upside down. 9. For goddesses, each one with the sign for eastern desert on her head, their names are. 1. Pesai. 2. Rikit. 3. Hershawes. 4. 
plus 8. 10. The god her U2F, holding a scepter in his left hand, and the sign of life, an ankh, in his right. The twelfth division of the Tuat, which is passed through by the sun god during the twelfth hour of the night, is introduced by three lines of text, and above the whole scene is a line of hieroglyphics. In the middle register are 1. The boat of the sun, in which stands the god under a canopy formed by the body of the serpent Mehen, on his head are horns and a disc. In the fore part of the boat is the beetle of Kepra, i.e., Kepra, which takes the place of the solar disc that rested on the prow of the boat in the eleventh hour. 2. Twelve gods, who are occupied in towing along the boat of the sun, each with his head turned behind him and looking at the boat, their names are 1. Haru 2. Shemsu 3. Fina 4. Beck 5. Oankiuf 6. Sebahuf 7. Aha Rare 8. Anqui 9. Nebamak 10. Seiki 11. Hak Nikmu 12. 3. The Monster Serpent Ka M Ankneteru 4. 12 Goddesses, who are occupied in towing the boat of the sun through the body of the Serpent Ka M Ankneteru, each has her head turned behind her, and is looking at the boat. Their names are 1. Stat 2. Karawachit 3. Kaith 4. Spert Netteres 5. Netamt 6. Nebcheta 7. Hedit 8. Enkhat Erman 9. Kurtut Tap 10. Etap M. Kades 11. Bet Netteres 12. Tisarapt In the upper register are 1. 12 goddesses, each of whom stands upright, and bears on her shoulders a serpent which belches forth fire from its mouth. Their names are 1. Nifert Kau 2. Kathyudin Ra 3. Netseshesh Ta 4. Nerfert Hertept 5. Suachet Aitbui Pet 6. Hat M. Tauies 7. Hat M. Sipues 8. Seket M. Kues 9. Hot M. Sipues 10. Kathank F 11. Hurt M. App 12. Ed R. M. Wa Apt 2. 12 gods, each of whom stands upright, and has both hands raised in adoration before him, their names are 1. Nebank 2. Hi 3. Neba 4. Neb Tuat 5. Nechimub 6. Ham 7. Wab 8. Hanu 9. Sensat 10. Mateponetero 11. Festeponetero 12. Hikanu In the lower register are 1. The god Nu, holding the scepter and Ankh in his left and right hand respectively. 2. The goddess Nut, holding the scepter and Ankh. 3. The god Hahu, holding the scepter and Ankh. 4. The goddess Hihut, holding the scepter and Ankh. 5. The god Tibai, man-headed, and holding an oar, or paddle. 6. The god Kashashef, man-headed, and holding a paddle. 7. The god Nawi, crocodile-headed, and holding a paddle. 8. The god Nai, with the heads of two birds, and holding a paddle. 9. The deity Nesmakef, in the form of a serpent, which pours forth fire from its mouth. 10. The god Nibaku, man-headed, and holding a paddle. 11. The god Kenti Thethef, man-headed, and holding a paddle. 12. The god Ahab, man-headed, and holding a paddle. 13. The god Tuati, man-headed, and holding a paddle. 14 to 23. 10 gods, each with his hands raised in adoration, their names are Tezku, Thimari, Akibu, Sakenu, Ermanu, Kenu Erman, Bone, Kuri, Athep, Aim Netter, 
24. The end of the tuat, which is represented by a semicircular wall or border formed of earth and stones, or perhaps granite. At the middle point of this border is the disk of the sun which is about to rise on this world, and joined to it is the head of the image of Shu, with his arms stretched out along the rounded border of the tuat. Above his head is the beetle, symbol of keeper, who has emerged from the boat of the sun god, and below is the image of Af, that is to say, the body of the night sun god, which has been cast away.